Holy City Center Radio. This is episode 143, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Friday, July 7th, 2023. Happy Friday, everyone. Another week is over. Weekend is upon us. And if you need some plans, don't worry, I got you covered. Go to holycitycenter.com slash events. And you can see what's coming up this weekend. And actually, that page is always, when you go to it, whatever the current day is, you'll see that, all the events listed. So any day of the week you can go. You want plans on Monday? You got it. You were off on work on Wednesdays and Thursdays? Check out the calendar. So no matter when you're looking for plans, that's the place to go. I also have a dedicated weekend events page. I usually keep it you know, on the, the main page of holycitycenter.com as the weekend is going on. So if you just want to see the weekend, that's the best way to do it. And I meant to apologize earlier this week. Nothing crazy. I just, uh, you know, if you hear any sniffles or, uh, you know, some coughs, I know Cole Collins with LMC Sound System does a great job of editing. So you may not have heard those little things or if my voice sounds a little different. I've been battling this summer cold. Battling is probably overstating it. I, you know, I've been fine. I've been going to work. Uh, only like one or two days that I feel kind of like, ugh, I just want to lay around and not do anything, you know. But that was even being dramatic. I was totally fine, but it's just been lingering, you know. Pretty much since I got back from Disney, a couple days after that, my dad was, you know, coughing pretty bad, and whatever he had passed to me. Thankfully, I didn't have uh, the cough like he did. Although I started to cough a little bit here and there, but he had it pretty bad, so. Thankfully, he's feeling better and, and sounding better. Uh, and, you know, I'm just I, I'm hoping I'm at the tail end of this thing. It's just annoying. You know, it's like a little bit of stuffiness, uh, a little bit of, you know, headache here and there. And, you know, just general like, oh, I just don't feel like myself. So I'm hoping it's the tail end. I'm hoping by I'm hoping by Monday I'll be back to normal. Uh, but we'll see. So apologies if things sound a little uh, worse than normal. Um you know, I like to keep a low bar here, but still, uh, hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, speaking of my parents, uh, unfortunately for me, they did leave. Uh, it's been a great visit. As I've mentioned, you know, they went to Disney with me as well as my brother and his family. My brother and his family um, have been gone for, uh, I think, like a week or so now. Um, but my parents stayed, uh, which was great, uh, being able to spend time with them. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, they they took off. So came back uh, to an empty house for the first time in many, many days, weeks, actually, uh, which was a, which is a bummer for sure. You know, of course, I like my space. You know, I, I have uh, I'm a bit of an introvert and a homebody at times as much as I do like to go out and do things. I have to be in the right mood and, you know, kind of sometimes mentally prepare myself uh, with my anxieties and stuff. But uh you know, uh, I love having my family here and, you know, they'll make comments like, oh, thanks for putting up with us or, oh, you know, we'll be out of your hair soon or whatever. And it's it's not even like that. You know, I enjoy having them here. I have a very good relationship with my family. I'm very, very lucky. So, uh, yeah, nice to have my space. The kitty is super excited to have his space back now that my parents um, dog is gone as well. He's a little afraid of her, although he was getting braver. Um, I, you know, certainly miss them and, uh, but very thankful and had a great time. Um, but, uh, back to being on my own, but I do have some, um, plans that, you know, I can, I have coming up that I'll be able to talk about in the podcast. So, you know, that's good. I have some things to look forward to and, uh, yeah, we'll see when, when the family comes back. Always a good time to have them here. Uh, that's about it. As far as what's going on in Holy City Centerland, um, still plugging along at the TV shows I mentioned, playing catch up on some things. Nothing really new going on. Hoping to get out to the movies though, as there's you know some good ones out in theaters. And you know if I check out something, I'll be sure to let you know. Um, the only other new thing is yes, I've hopped on Threads. What is Threads? For those who don't know, Instagram slash Facebook, since Facebook owns Instagram and technically the company name is Meta. So Meta, the company that owns Facebook and Instagram, launched Threads, which is basically Twitter. Um, but you uh, use your basically you sign up using your Instagram account logins. Um, you know, they're they're looking to be a rival to Twitter, of course. A lot of people are excited about it, especially people who don't like the direction Twitter's been going in since Elon Musk took over. Uh, we'll see. You know, it's not like Meta. You know, Facebook is this amazing company um, who never does anything wrong. Uh, so uh, I think Zuckerberg is a, a little bit 
he's still a villain as well. Um, but at the moment, maybe not as much as so as Elon Musk. But yes, you can find me over on threads at the for now. We'll see how often I use it, but feel free to follow along and, um, you know, uh, we'll see what happens there. But with that, let's get into the news. All right. First, an update on that situation where a woman was found on the road on James Island. The family of that James Island woman who was found severely injured back on June 21st says the reward for information about the incident has nearly tripled over the last week. For those who don't remember, the woman, Jen Drummond, was found unconscious and lying in the middle of Woodland Shore Road. By the way, as a side note, there are plans to build a sidewalk Um, on that road and there is a meeting coming up about it this was already in the works and is not related to this accident Um, but it kind of paints a picture that residents in that area have been asking for it because although the speed limit on that road is pretty low i believe it was like 30 miles per hour people apparently are constantly you know are, are driving down that road much faster and so there's been a call for you know sidewalks to be safer for pedestrians so there is a meeting coming up where they're going to provide updates on that so just wanted to put that as a side note to add some context to you know what may have happened is some people are thinking she may have been hit by a car so in any event the family which includes chris drummond uh, he is jen's uncle he's kind of been the spokesperson in the media uh, has said that a reward that started out at a thousand dollars Um, had increased last week to $3,000 and then got up to $8,000. Last I checked online, it is now up to $10,000. This is a lot of money, and hopefully that'll bring someone forward with information about what happened to Jen. So as far as her, she is um, remaining in the hospital. She's still in critical condition. Uh, a sheriff spokesman uh, told Live 5 News that investigators are still working to determine the exact nature of her injuries, which are, you know, they're labeling as suspicious. Uh, late last week, deputies released surveillance photographs of vehicles that they pulled from like surveillance cameras, you know, like a, a ring doorbell or something like that. Um, they were trying to identify, you know, maybe one of these vehicles might have information, whether it's they saw her or did not see her when they were driving to try to get a timeline down, or if maybe they're um, responsible for whatever happened to her. So they released those. I talked about them on a past podcast. Uh, you can visit the link in the show notes today, and you can see those photos. There's three separate vehicles that they're interested in getting more information about. If you have any information about those vehicles or anything related to what may have happened, uh, you were asked to contact Master Deputy Colt Arrington at 843-202-1700. You can also email him. It's C-B-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N at charlestoncounty.org. You can also call Crime Stoppers at 843 554 1111. Uh, Again, if you miss those, of course, you can rewind, but you can also check the show notes. It is in the article from Live 5 News to make it a little easier for you. Our second presidential visit uh, within the last week, you may remember, of course, former President Donald Trump uh, was in Pickens for a rally uh, just last week. Uh, But on Thursday, President Joe Biden was here in the Palmetto State. He was uh, not in the Charleston area, though. He's up in the West Columbia region. Um, And it wasn't an official campaign stop like uh, Trump's was. This was more him just trying to tout some things his, um, you know, his economic plans have done and things like that. Uh, So he not only was there to tout those things, he was also kind of making a case for reelection in 2024. Part of Biden's trip is to visit, you know, red states. And of course, South Carolina is very red and wanted to talk, you know, to the folks in Republican led states about you know factory jobs um that have have uh come up because of his economic measures that were pushed through com- uh, congress despite opposition from republicans and as he was talking he's you know he has like a nod to the next election coming up saying that government investments in computer trips batteries and electric vehicles will help the US outcompete a country like China uh and that his agenda has delivered in ways that former president Donald Trump could not so while he's there, you know, touting reelection and talking about how his economic plans have worked and things, he also took a couple digs at Republicans uh, who oppose, you know, number one, his Inflation Reduction Act, as well as uh, the recent uh, bipartisan infrastructure laws that we've talked about here on this podcast. Uh, although 
some did vote for the infrastructure law. At one point he said, uh, I didn't get much help from the other team, but that didn't stop us from getting it done. Every Republican member of Congress voted against the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, in addition to Biden's comments, the White House had some official comments saying that they maintain if Republicans had their way, South Carolina, like many other Republican-controlled states, would have lost out on billions of dollars in investments and thousands of jobs. Now, on the flip side, of course, GOP lawmakers disagree with that, saying that Biden's initiatives have helped fuel higher inflation and thus have left people worse off. Two things can be true. Inflation can be bad, but the economy can be doing OK and jobs can be created. Uh, so there's, you know, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. I am no economic expert, that is for sure. Uh, in addition to the things we've mentioned already, President Biden also was trying to showcase some new clean energy manufacturing, including a partnership between a solar firm here in South Carolina called Enphase Energy and manufacturer Flex Limited. Uh, that project is expected to create 600 jobs here in South Carolina and 1,200 more throughout the country. Enphase, which is making a $60 million investment to open six new manufacturing lines, which, by the way, includes two here in South Carolina, is benefiting from tax incentives that were included in Biden's Inflation Reduction Act that passed last August. Uh, and of course, I have to highlight some digs uh, that President Biden took. He took one dig at uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the representative from Georgia, who I'm sure you are all very well aware of, uh, saying that there's some project in her district uh, that is a result of his um, policies and that he's going to be down there for the groundbreaking or ribbon cutting, whatever it is. So that that should be good. Uh, but also he took a, a dig at um, Nancy Mace, who he didn't mention by name, but did make a quote uh, saying all those members of Congress who voted against it, talking about whether it's the Inflation Act or the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law, suddenly realize how great it is and they're bragging about it. Um, obviously a nod, not just to Representative Nancy Mace, but lots of Republicans who voted against these pieces of legislation, but then tried to take credit for the projects that came to their state. Uh, some, like Nancy Mace, were called out on it by media as well as constituents. So, uh, yes, uh, two presidential visits within a week, and you know what that means. We are very much in election season. I know the election isn't until uh, next year, but prepare for more and more visits, especially since South Carolina is first in the South for voting in Republican primaries, and Democrats have moved it up to first in the country uh, for their primary. So you can expect more and more of these visits, especially from Republicans, since they have a lot more people running on the ticket, whereas Democrats, I think, still only have two. Of course, Biden and maniac Robert Kennedy uh, Jr., um, who I haven't talked yet on this podcast, but is an anti-vaxxer and all sorts of other things, and not just anti-COVID, like anti-vaccinations, period. So uh, it's a whole other story, which I'm sure we'll get into as he inevitably will visit this state. But for now, let's move on from presidential things and get to some other pieces of news. What is going on with golf cart accidents? And no, this is not me blaming the golf carts because more times than not, it's the people that hit them that are to blame. Of course, you're all familiar with that horrific accident that happened on Folly Beach. But just this past, you know, handful of days over this, you know, for some people, long weekend uh, for the holiday, um, there's been uh, four golf cart incidents uh, in the last four days. When you hear this, you know, five days, but you get it. Uh, so, and, and some of these incidents are pretty scary. You know, and it, for instance, uh, News 2 is talking about some of these accidents, and they mentioned one that happened on Isle of Palms, and it was pretty terrifying for the family because they were hit by a drunk driver. Uh, according to Isle of Palms police, the driver of the vehicle, uh, he caused the collision and was arrested for DUI. The police department also said that the family was traveling in what's called a low-speed vehicle. That can be a golf cart or something similar, which, by the way, is completely legal um, on Isle of Palms and allowed to be driven at night. Um, they also took uh, a safety precaution, the family that is, and that precaution, which was just simply wearing seatbelts, may have saved their lives. So I know we see people on golf carts, whether it's downtown or in the beaches, um, a lot of times they're not wearing seatbelts, of course. You don't think of that when you're thinking of a golf cart, uh, but it may have ended up saving these folks' lives as the car or the golf cart ended up being knocked on its side. And, you know, things could have been a lot worse, although they some 
excuse me, although some of them were brought to the hospital with minor injuries, it could have been a lot worse. Um, that was the, the Isle of Palms crash was the third crash involving a golf cart or the similarly or the uh, similar low speed vehicle in the past four days. As I mentioned, another crash happened on Isle of Palms on Saturday, and then there was one on Sunday in downtown Charleston. The one on Sunday was a little bit more serious. Uh, someone reached out to me to say that their friend was one of the people in the golf cart and was pretty badly hurt expected to make a full recovery and you know so that's great but you know suffered some you know bad injuries including broken bones and things uh the other incident although not a crash is still scary um, and involves a golf cart uh, one caught fire in charleston county on tuesday so all sorts of things going on with uh golf carts in the area and like i said it seems more oftentimes than not, although some of these uh, investigations are still going and police haven't released details, it seems the fault lies with the cars not paying attention or, in you know, the case of the first person being drunk, you know, so people are quick to be like, there shouldn't be golf carts on the road. But it seems like it's really the cars that are causing the problem. So although it may be frustrating to get stuck behind a golf cart on certain streets or, um, you know, just like it is with a horse carriage when you're downtown. You know, they're not doing anything illegal necessarily. Uh, there are rules and regulations for these things, but oftentimes they're not doing anything wrong when they get in these accidents. So everybody just slow down, be a little bit more careful out there and just keep your eyes on the road. We have to share it. If you're in a car, you have to share it with pedestrians. You have to share it with horse carriages downtown. You have to share it with golf carts in some community. So just be careful out there. As frustrating as it may be, uh, just be careful. All right. Uh, I also wanted to highlight, a, uh, it was actually an editorial that was in the Post and Courier. And although it's, it was an opinion piece, and I, I know a lot of people listen to my podcast probably have the same opinions as me and, and also in this piece, um, not everyone does. And I, and I do want to say it is an opinion. However, there were some details in there that are true and are not up for dispute. So I, I think it's an important read that people should look at. And, and what this opinion piece was about, and again, the show is in the show, or the link is in the show notes, of course, is about the South Carolina um, House's so-called Freedom Caucus, which I've mentioned many, many times on this podcast. They're a very conservative faction of the Republican Party in the South Carolina State House. You know, they've been uh, up to all sorts of shenanigans, as you probably remember on past podcasts. But this particular editorial was about a lawsuit they filed against the Lexington County School District, specifically District 1. Uh, that school district recently settled that lot lawsuit and claimed, which, by the way, the lawsuit claimed without any support whatsoever, that the school district was teaching controversial concepts about race and gender that are barred by South Carolina law. So a couple things. First of all, this is one of those CRT panic things, the LGBTQ community panic things that we've been seeing where people are trying to limit what is taught in schools. A lot of times they're claiming, you know, uh, you know, CRT, this graduate level theory course is being taught in schools. It's not. Uh, and then when you point that out, it's like, well, it's similar to it. And... More times than not, and the vast majority of times, it's not related at all. It's not controversial, uh, but they that's not really the point. Um, that's just the cover for just trying to block these topics altogether. So anyway, they, they filed this lawsuit last year, and the Post and Courier put, says in this editorial that it was clearly a harassment suit. It's one of those suits where they're just trying to bother someone, trying to send a message, but they don't really have a case. And as the editorial pointed out, even if you believe that everything the Freedom Caucus was alleging in their complaint, if you believed all of it was true, and as they put it, that's a dubious assumption, but even if it, you believed it all, the district still would not have been violating state law. The Freedom Caucus, among some others in the Republican Party, have tried to pass legislation that goes further than current state law. But current state law already forbids topics um, being taught in class that involve things like saying one race is superior to the other. I mean, obviously, right? That should not be taught in schools. So there's all these laws in place about not teaching anything racist or bigoted. And, and so based on the claims, none of those nothing that they claimed fit under that category. It wasn't illegal, but they still filed this lawsuit. It still has to, you know, go through the process. Well, the school district decided to settle. It was just in their best interest to do that. 
and just to step back for a second, I mentioned what law does prohibit. What it does not prohibit is teachers having students read books by black authors or, or white authors for that matter. Um, it also doesn't prohibit them for, from having students read books that have mostly black main characters. But those are the types of things that the Freedom Caucus is saying falls on was was against state law, you know, and trying to claim CRT and all that stuff. But none of those are illegal under state law, and nor should they be, obviously. So why settle if you're not doing anything illegal? And as the Post and Courier pointed out, that settlement can create the impression, uh, especially because Fox News picked up on this uh, settlement and, of course, ran with it and made it seem like the school district was admitting wrongdoing, which they weren't, um, it makes it seem like the district was indeed violating the law and that the Freedom Caucus had stepped in and saved the day, none of which is true. Uh, the Post and Courier said that the Charleston County School District superintendent in their lawsuit, you know, had a, comp- or I'm sorry, the former Charleston County School District superintendent, now superintendent over in Lexington, that's Garita uh, Post- Postalweight, she had a completely uh, appropriate reason to settle. It became clear that the caucus was just like on a fishing expedition and that the district was going to have to pay a ton of money that could be spent on things like classrooms and you know uh, making sure their schools uh, have the necessary materials and, and are up to date and all that good stuff. They were going to have to move that money so that they could fight the lawsuit and then have the appropriate help to find and produce any requested documents. Yeah, Freedom Caucus really cares about schools when they're doing these harassment suits. And this isn't the only one, by the way, that they're trying to, to settle or they're, that they've you know, have, have brought to court. And so the school district said, okay, why waste money? Plus, what's the point of winning the suit? You know, we haven't violated any state law. And all that the settlement, I keep saying settlement, settlement, it might make you think they had to pay money or something, but all the settlement actually required was them to stop contracting a specific consulting group. That's it. And so for them, it just made sense to settle. Why waste money? Why open us open ourselves up to something else? They're going to find something else that was assigned and try to twist that around. And, and so they just decided, let's end this. The other big point to the settlement is they did not have to uh, admit any wrongdoing. So even though it was trying to be spun in the news that, oh, they settled and that's a win for the Freedom Caucus, they really were just like, this is a waste of money and time, and let's just get back to what's important, which is having this money go towards our school and teaching our children. We'll just cut ties with this consulting agency, whatever. And so, uh, you know, that's the right move. But of course, the problem with settling the case is, one, it's not an isolated incident. It's going to continue, and they're going to be emboldened by this. And again, too, the optics make it seem like maybe the Freedom Caucus did the right thing, when in fact they did not. They're just wasting time and money from our schools under the guise of trying to protect children and parental rights and all that BS that they've been doing over the last year plus. So as the Post and Courier pointed out, you know, although it would be good for our society uh, for the Freedom Caucus to be forced to prove that the allegations were true and that what they're alleging was actually against state law, uh, that would have been better for society. And we could have been like, hey, look, these schools aren't doing what these wackos have been claiming they've been doing. They're losing lawsuits left and right because it's not happening and they're just trying to ban topics that they don't like whether it's outright bigotry and racism or 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 something else unfortunately schools and whoever else may fall victim to one of these harassment suits it's just in their best interest just to say you know what fine whatever we'll cut ties with this consulting firm or whatever we'll whatever the you know as long as we don't have to admit any wrongdoing and we can just stop this we're just going to do it so good for them but bad for the bigger picture so that's kind of what I was talking about it, it gave me some insight again i know it's an editorial giving opinion but it, it did give some insight into what these lawsuits are and what they're alleging and then what schools are doing instead of trying to waste money on it so definitely you know check that out and just you know i wanted to have everyone just keep your eye on this freedom caucus they're going to be a thorn in the state side for a while. And as I mentioned in the past, this isn't even just like a, you know, progressive and liberals versus Republicans and conservatives thing. Like a lot of people in the current South Carolina Republican Party do not like or agree 
with the Freedom Caucus and what they're doing. So this is a menace for the state that both parties have members that are like, what is going on? We need to stop these people. So definitely something to keep an eye on going forward. All right. And lastly, another uh, amazing piece of journalism, this one done by uh, Reuters, who, you know, they're kind of like the Associated Press. Most people are a little bit more familiar with the AP, you know, where they, you know, they're uh, journalists who provide stories that end up getting run, you know, syndicated basically in papers um, and websites that may not have like a national correspondent. They can pull these stories from them. They did this multi-part series called um slavery's descendants and the link is in the show notes you should definitely check it out and basically it features the ancestral ties of today's political elite to slaveholding and they found that 118 of america's most influential leaders have a slaveholding ancestor now before we get too too much further this is not a reuters nor myself uh this is not a shame on these people moment because obviously these are members of whether it's congress or a supreme court justice or a president or governor or whatever obviously the people living today have not enslaved anyone no one in their family has done so in generations i think in south carolina the closest link was three generations old so this isn't like a oh Shame on them. This party's bad for this reason. As you'll see in South Carolina, the ties are majority are with the Republican Party. It's not nothing like that. It's just as uh, Reuters said, they put this together because at a time of renewed debate over what slavery's legacy is and what can and can't be taught about it in schools, many leaders have taken positions on policies that are related to race, as I mentioned CRT before. So Reuters sought to determine how many political elites descended from slaveholders and what it means for them when they learn those facts, because some of them at least claim they had no idea that anyone in their family owned, uh, you know, enslaved people. Maybe they didn't know their family's ties to slavery, period. So they just wanted to see what that meant to politicians uh, and, and what they would say. No surprise, most did not comment, uh, but some did. So, quick rundown. They found that five living presidents had uh, ancestors that enslaved people. Those five living presidents were Biden, Obama, Bush, Clinton, and Carter. One note for Obama. uh, Obviously, it was the white side of his family that enslaved people here in America. Um, His black ancestors, he had some that were enslaved. So he kind of, his family has seen both sides of it. The only living president not on that list was Donald Trump. His family did not enslave anyone, according to Reuters um, research. Part of that reason, potentially, is because his family didn't move here until after slavery had ended. So who knows what his family may have done if they were here, but they weren't. And so that's the point I'm trying to get across here. Uh, two Supreme Court justices, Gorsuch, Gorsuch excuse me, and uh, Amy Coney Barrett, they both had enslavers in uh, their family's history, as did 11 governors, including our own Henry McMaster. His, he's the one, by the way, who was only three generations removed. That was the closest one on the list. And 100 legislators, so, you know, uh, representatives and senators, and several from South Carolina, we'll get into that in a moment, uh, they all also descended from ancestors who enslaved black people. Uh, Some more details. Reuters found that at least 8% of Democrats in the last Congress and 28% of Republicans have ancestral ties to enslavers. You know, so not huge percentages, but 8% of Democrats and 28% of Republicans. Unsurprisingly, as I mentioned, few were willing to talk about their their family's ties uh, to, you know, what people call America's original sin. The Reuters examination reveals, you know, kind of how intimately tied America remains to the institute of, institution of slavery, including through people who make the laws that currently govern our country. And although this isn't their fault, what their family has done in the past, you have to wonder a, a few things, such as what role did generational wealth play in their lives? People who had uh, enslaved people obviously had some form of money for the most part. 
and uh, whether that was very wealthy or just you know doing pretty well, but you had to have a pretty good amount of money. Uh, did that pass down to generation to generation, and did that money then help, as we know how important money is in politics, help people get elected? Did their family name, because those prominent folks who enslaved people, maybe they were involved in politics, or just the name uh, was prominent in communities and, and raising that profile, and the fact that a lot of places in the South uh, didn't really have an appropriate reckoning, and in some instances still haven't, with the institution of slavery and their role in it. You know, did that lead and help these people get a, a foot ahead, a step ahead? Now, again, not their fault. It just did it, though. You know, just something you, that's curious and you wonder about how uh, you can draw a direct line from the institution of slavery still to today. And you can in many ways. So I think it's just an interesting examination. And although some people are going to want to turn this into something it's not, that's really what the point of this uh, piece was and, and why I'm sharing it with you all. Because we like to talk about some people in this country like, oh, we can't, we shouldn't look at the past. Let's move forward, which is funny because it's the same people who say we can't delete history and destroy history by taking down monuments, but they don't want to talk about this part of history and they don't want it to be in schools and stuff like that. Well, you can't have it both ways. So we're going to talk about the history and what advantages that may have brought to people or how it may have shaped them. You know, if, if people were enslaving other humans in your family, their bigotry may have been passed down and although it is nowhere nowhere near what it was like back then of course does that permeate some of these candidates you know who knows so let's go here to south carolina as i'm very much running out of time on this episode every member of south carolina's congressional delegation every member that means every single person that south carolina currently has on the federal level in congress and in the house of representatives has an ancestral link to slavery. Now, the state's two black members of Congress, Senator Tim Scott and Representative Jim Clyburn, have ancestors who were enslaved. So that's their ties. The rest, which are uh, seven people, all white, as well as Governor Henry McMaster, although he's not part of Congress, you know, he is obviously our governor in his state. So the seven other uh, lawmakers, all white, and Governor McMaster are all direct descendants of a slaveholder or multiple slaveholders. And then the piece really dives into it. So, for example, Senator Lindsey Graham's great, great, great grandfather enslaved eight people. Um, as we go through, I'm not going to you know, get into details about all of them, but you can look it up on the link in the show notes. It's got the ancestor's name, how many people um, they enslaved, uh, their relationship to the political elite today, and if the uh, person, so in this case, Lindsey Graham, uh, provided any kind of quote or statement based on these findings. Um, no, no surprise, he, they really didn't. Uh, most folks did not provide any statement. Uh, in Graham's case, you know, I think a staffer said something like, oh, you know, Senator Lindsey Graham thinks slavery is America's original sin um, and, and wants to continue to move forward and, and focus on today, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, he's included. Uh, next up is Representative Nancy Mace, who originally, according to Reuters, agreed to an interview, then canceled that interview and eventually provided a statement. Her statement, just like when uh, she should have been more prepared for being questioned about voting against the infrastructure law and bombed the answer, she completely bombed this answer. She said, quote, I don't recognize these people named, talking about the family members that Reuters found um, that enslaved people, and can't confirm they are relatives. But slavery was a stain on this country, and we as Americans should be grateful for the progress we've made since the 1860s. Just a complete bungle. The, the, the attempt to distance yourself by saying, I don't recognize these family members named, and he can't even confirm their relatives. Well, that, that's probably true, honestly. She may not recognize the names, and she may not have done work to confirm it, and she's under no obligation to do that. But why is that your like defense? It's like, oh, uh, you know, this might be fake news. That's kind of what she's trying to set up for here when they're just interested in what she thinks about it. 
And so just a, just a dumb thing to say. And then the fact that she, we should be grateful for the progress. So basically like, Hey, people who are still discriminated against in this country or may still be feeling the effects generations later, just be happy that you're not slaves anymore. You know, that's what it reads like. And just, just a horrible answer. She would have been better just sticking with the canceled interview. Honestly, I just, I just don't understand how she's so bad at this stuff. But anyway, I just want to highlight hers um, because it had more detail than some of the others. For her, it was her great, 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 so three times great grandmother, whose name, by the way, was Drusilla Mace, which, as people have pointed out, sounds like a Disney villain, like Drusilla. Like I'm, you know, envisioning the, you know, Cruella de Vil um, from 101 Dalmatians, like just a villain name, and it's just so perfect. Um, so anyway, her and her son, John Mace, uh, were both slaveholders, and they had this really interesting detail that decades after emancipation, um, a man who was formerly enslaved by John Mace, um, he gave an interview, and he was recalling when he was being made to work for Mace, John Mace, that is, um, who, by the way, in 1860 had enslaved seven people and is Nancy Mace's great-great-grandfather. Um, so anyway, in an interview in 1937, the man whose name was Hector Godbolt recounted watching an overseer who was summoned by John Mace's wife uh, put an enslaved person over a fence plank and whip him 75 times with what is called a cat o' nine tails, which is named for the nine knotted strands um, at the end of each like you know whip uh, to make sure that it inflicted the most pain and damage to, to someone's back as possible. After the 75 lashes, uh, Godbolt said that there was blood running down this poor guy's back, uh, just like you would see a stream run. So, again, this is not Nancy Mace's fault. It has nothing to do with her, but it is, you know, in her past. And it, it, it highlights, although we all know how horrible slavery was, well, and is, because as we know, in other parts of the country, there's different types of slavery specifically would, you know, and there's still trafficking and things. Um, but in this country back then, what it was like and how brutal it really was. A lot of times those details aren't shared because it, people don't want to talk about the ugly side of things. And, and I think that provides just a very, very small sample <clears throat> of the types of horrible things that happened to, to people who were enslaved. So anyway, uh, the rest of the reps, as I mentioned, also have ties. I'll just quickly highlight them. Representative Joe Wilson had at least five slaveholders among his forebearers. They enslaved at least 16 people. He is someone who in the past has talked about how important, um, you know, respecting history is and how proud he was of his family. And he was ardently against the Confederate flag coming down. Um, uh, not just, um, in recent times, but back in what was it, 2000, when there was a debate about removing it from the state house and putting it outside, talking about how proud he was of his family members. And he mentioned one of those family members by name, and turns out one of them was a slaveholder. So, not so great there. Um, the rest of South Carolina's leaders, Jeff Duncan's ancestors, enslaved five people. Representative Ralph Norman's uh, enslaved 61. Representative Tom Rice enslaved 64, which was the most out of anyone in South Carolina. Representative William Timmons' family enslaved two, and Governor Henry McMaster's family enslaved four people. So, as I mentioned, definitely go check out the show notes because there's a lot more to this multi-part series. It's really, really fascinating. Um, and again, just this wasn't a, 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 an attempt by Reuters or myself by relaying it to shame anyone who lives today. It's not their fault what their ancestors did. And besides Joe Wilson, it doesn't seem like uh, anyone had even mentioned these relatives by name previously. And they may not even known they existed, let alone, let alone who they enslaved. But the reasons I mentioned at the top make this topic very interesting and something to talk about. Again, how long... Can things like generational wealth and the leg up that some people's families had at the time uh, continues many generations later and their status and the wealth and all that leads them to possibly be in politics today. And again, not their fault, but it, it is interesting to look at. So that's why I wanted to highlight that. And I recommend you all check out the multi-part series.
That'll do it for this edition of Holy City Center Radio. It's been hot out there, so stay cool, stay safe. You know, be on the lookout for yourself and any others who could be you know, suffering from any heat-related illnesses. You know, we've seen in other parts of this country over the last few days people dying from the heat. And uh, although we're not facing the extreme heat that places like Texas are, it is very hot. So just be careful out there and look out for others, maybe especially folks who don't have air conditioning or, you know, um, whatever else might put them in danger of being in the heat for extended amounts of time. Outside of that, don't be afraid to go out and have some fun. You can also do indoor events. Go to holycitycenter.com slash events to see what's going on. Speaking of the website, if you want to support Holy City Center and this podcast and anything else I do, you can go to holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up some merchandise or go to patreon.com slash holycitycenter to sign up for one of those support tiers. Thank you to Cole Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this and every episode of Holy City Center Radio. I also want to thank Tyler Boone, whose music you hear each and every episode as well. And a big thank you to all of you for listening, supporting, following, all the good stuff you do. I really, really appreciate it. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite streaming platform so you don't miss any episodes. And then if you want to help me out, like the podcast, review it, uh, whatever you can do to, you know, tell people about this show and what you think of it that helps out enjoy your weekend i plan on it certainly not wishing the weekend away but i can't wait to talk to you all on monday until then good night and good luck Nothing.